ओके वेलकम टू द लास्ट सेशन लास्ट डे लास्ट सेशन ऑफ शोकेसिंग आर आर आई अवर फर्स्ट स्पीकर इन दिस सेशन इज प्रभु ही इज़ अ रिसर्च साइंटिस्ट इन द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग सर्विसेज डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ आर आर आई ही वर्कस ऑन वेरियस एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ रेडियो एस्ट्रोनॉमी इंस्ट्रूमेंटेशन एंड टूडे ही विल गिव अस एन ओवर व्यू ऑफ द स्क्वायर किलोमीटर एरे टेलीस्कोप एक्टिविटीज एट आर आर आई a uh, very good evening everyone and i'm happy and glad to be here on this occasion 75th i had a chance to be on 5th 50th year also uh, so it's so nice and uh, very exciting and thank the organizers and adarai to have given a chance for many of us to work for so many years here uh, and uh, happily and also for being part of the event today and i will be talking about the square kilometer array which has been a, one of the recent project that we have started working at the roman research institute and i will give a brief uh, introduction uh, background on this topic uh, not not about the square kilometer array but about how this project came along and what is the background that made us to go in and then i talk about three things i'll spend more time on the first of the three bullet points here the pulsar timing and search and uh, leading to the beam forming and showing what is next so there are actually three things here talking about current ongoing and the future okay there are a lot of very enthusiastic extremely expertized uh, hands working on it good people uh, having a lot of experience the names i have given below and of course shiv is not here uh, who is sort of keeping us together as a group okay now uh, each one have got a different area of expertise developed over here that comes from a variety of different things which began all the way back in the gauri binu radio telescope the lab that we work today uh, was the one which was used for producing instrumentation for the gauri binu telescope was fully built uh, using instrumentation the, the spin off from here iaa uh, has and their facilities in the same place and a lot of institutions have come up and rr is continue to maintain this place and have our facilities uh, well established and uti radio telescope and the receiver link receiver was built at again the same laboratory uh, and uh, and as you go up up in this arrow you would see there's an uh, the antenna or all of dish type and there's a millimeter wave radio telescope that existed in the campus that worked at very 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 high uh, frequency of 100 gigahertz and that's one of the very few telescopes that existed at that time in in this part of this world and uh, the entire telescope was constructed in the campus including the electronics and the lab that we used to work at that time used to call mmw lab okay and when the gribinu work was happening that used to be called as decameter wave lab dmw lab and then we moved on to build things for the gmrt there were several things we built but i am highlighting the things which survived for 25 years the l band receiver now called band 5 receiver all almost almost all of the observation that has happened with the l band till today uh, is actually using the receiver that is built by our uh, colleague hiding here okay sharma ji and ragu and it's still operational and it all that all the bands are flagship for the gmrt but l band is even more because rfi and other things keeps that band even more quieter and nice and there was also activity for the 50 megahertz in other words the lowest frequency and the highest frequency we had uh, invested and uh, 1400 megahertz is still operation going downward from gauri binu there was this mauritius radio telescope collaboration with the mauritius university and it was 150 megahertz radio telescope again built in the same building which you now call it as by different names dome building electronics lab and all kinds of names and mrt lab that was then i recall it was called as and then moving further this way the machison wide field array which is a precursor to the square kilometer array uh, which is an aperture array and again the receiver for the telescope was built developed so about a 6 7 years of work in the late uh, 2000 to early to 2010 that receivers are working there now as of now 10 years exactly 10 years and none of them failed okay, almost all the receivers that was built by our group are completely working and they are trying hard to make them 
changed, but actually they are very happy with this uh, receiver's performance. And although performance in terms of frequency coverage band and so on, one would want to increase, but reliability and producing what it was supposed to produce has been happening. And almost all the papers, nearly 200 odd papers, and I think 150 or so observational papers, all of them used our receivers. And which has got about 50 of those papers have authors from RRI and a few PhD students from RRI as well. Going further, as you see downward, these are called aperture arrays. And as you go upward, they are dish antennas. The square kilometer is a conglomeration of dish and aperture arrays. So there are actually two parts sitting in two different continents. And it's a giant of all these antennas. We call GMRT as a giant meter wave radio telescope. It's much uh, bigger in terms of frequency coverage and also in its capability sensitivity. And we'll talk about it. It's an ongoing activity. I have not discussed about the <laughs> talk uh, that have been already covered. There are other upcoming space telescopes, X-ray missions, and also this is the Cosmic Dawn UR experiments, and the one which has been flown AstroSat. They are covered elsewhere in other talks. So these are mainly the ground-based ones. So these telescopes have, uh, have been the experience and expertise for the current work. Uh, current uh, people who are working for the uh, square kilometer array work. And it's a kind of a heritage tradition. And that is how the electronics expertise in the campus got developed. And it's almost everything, anything from all the way digitizing a very weak signal to signal processing and data uh, handling. And also even observational uh, modes and things like that, that became possible. A, a nice book written by Francis Graham Smith when he was 94 we had some contributions, mainly from due to this background in bringing this book out. Uh, he was 94 when the book was released, now he's 99, and he has suggested us to do the next edition and lead the book. <laughs> okay, so hopefully if there are volunteers, uh, enthusiastic volunteers, we can take it up. Francis Graham is the uh, Astronomer Royal of UK. Astronomer Royal, yeah. So now, <laughs> Coming back, the square kilometer array, oh, that's just a blink, I don't know, is in two continents, one in South Africa, one in Western Australia. The dish type antenna uh, is located in uh, Southern Africa, uh, a desert. And the aperture array, which is basically antenna dipoles and so on, they are located in uh, extremely radio quiet place. We have, our colleagues have been there and we have spent a lot of time commissioning the prior prototype of the SKA 10 years ago. Uh, so it's like uh, only 163 people in a very large area. If you compare with the Bangalore population, we have about 2,200 per kilometer square, make recircle to Tata Institute, draw a square somewhere halfway down. And uh, the average density is that. Uh, whereas here, it is like 163 people per much bigger area. So these numbers from Wikipedia, you can check this anyway. Uh, okay, now which means what? There's less radio uh, interference. And for radio astronomy, radio telescopes to operate, we can't have mobile phones and or TV household electronics sitting inside and so on. They are disturbance for the operation. So it's good to have a place where these things are not there. And that is also the reason why people talked about going to lunar orbit for the low frequency observations. In other words, some of the extremely important bands, the UR bands, if only people knew about it earlier, they would have got them protected. The FM band, which we all enjoy for music, would not have got allotted for that. That's where the most discovery is going to happen. And that band, you cannot operate in Earth anywhere. So that's the way the telescope is organized. I'm, uh, the, our, our focus currently mostly on the Aperture Array telescope, which is located in the Western Australia, the instrumentation activity, mostly I'll be talking about it. And uh, the telescope itself consists of about 256 dipoles, like you see in this rotating, it's called a station. It's like a single dish when electronically combined. You can look at different directions and so on. And the individual antennas look something like this. It's like a coat hanger. Antenna design is a very, very complex task. And people, there are people here, experts here, 
who have put in a lot of time and effort in making them work across a large bandwidth. And it is indeed a challenge to make an antenna work 50 MHz to 350, several octaves in bandwidth. It's, it's an impossible task for a single element to work. That's why we go for what is known as log periodic. When you have a log periodic, it can produce structures that you are actually looking for in the UR spectrum, so which is not desirable. So optimizing them is a big task. The way it is done, antenna design, it takes long time. And when you keep the antennas next to each other, they also will talk to each other, cross talks. It has to be optimized. Every antenna position will have its own cross talk. So this project is very mammoth. And each one of the dipoles, and total of 1,30,000 dipoles will be digitized. And that's one of the biggest ever uh, digitized antenna array operation that's going to be uh, on Earth so far. So no other place uh, any such big array has been implemented and uh, operated. And now our involvement, three prime areas. One is uh, related to the pulsars, pulsar search, pulsar timing, and so on. That leads us to another work, which is about forming multiple beams in the sky and and also working towards the next generation. I will show what it means. Pulsars produce a very nice looking spikes. They're actually not nice, but very periodic uh, pulsars. And, uh, and our one of the work that we are looking at is to time the gaps and why do we have to do that I will tell. And the other one is also look for such pulsars. These are objects, very strange and extreme objects. Uh, another activity is related to forming multiple uh, beams, which means looking at simultaneously multiple places in the sky. Uh, that's an ongoing work. And uh, the last one is about going, what is next, next generation, okay. Astronomers always, uh, radio astronomy and all other instrumentation, people always are very, very, like any other experimentalist, always greedy of expanding their you know, ability to investigate more areas, diverse areas. So extending into that area, you need more bandwidth, higher resolution, higher dynamic range, and so on. The last one is supposed to address those problems in a compact manner. So pulsars, these are neutron stars. Many of you probably know about it, but I will just go through quickly. And they rapidly rotate. The fastest one can rotate like a millisecond. A thousand times it will go around in a second, and the slowest one is known to be about tens of seconds, okay, 26. So it takes, so it takes 24 hours. So that's a kind of rotation, and then they are very, very, very accurate in their periodicities. But when I say that, but it is not entirely true, they also slow down. We can come to that. I have very strong magnetic fields, and if you can read this axis, you will see that Gauss, uh, 10 power 10 all the way to 10, the upper, upper number is 10 power 14 Gauss. So if you could map it with anything that we know of, uh, it's enormous and we can't produce these numbers on Earth. And it's, they have a rotational kinetic energy converted in the magnetic dipole radiation and then they emit. The entire, uh, 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 the, the emission can be in entire electromagnetic spectrum and uh, detection is possible only when their magnetic axis and the spin axis are misaligned and we happen to be in the line of sight. Now, we observe them as a pulsed radiation, as you saw in the previous animation, and their, their period, they vary in all kind of, kind of a garden pulsars. Period can vary, the pulse width can vary, and the distance can vary, and so on. They are basically, in some sense, cosmic clocks. Why they are clocked? Because their arrival time can be exactly predicted, modeled, and so on. So there is this technique called pulsar timing, and radio telescopes can be used to look at them. So what you see here is a mix of pulsars that have been seen, little old diagram, but it gives an essence of where they have been seen. Along this axis is a period, and it goes a little more here now, and these are the period derivative, how much they slow down. If I put it as another cartoon, same diagram, so we have young pulsars sitting in this place, mature pulsars here, and recycled pulsar here. The pulsars of interest to use them as cosmic clocks for some scientific experiment, lies somewhere here. Okay. But they are not very many. And today we know about 3,000, a little lower than that number of pulsars, and of which only some 50, 60 pulsars can be used for this kind of a clock experiment. 
as you probably know, this uh, first discovery of a pulsar in a binary system that has helped to actually indirectly verify the first time for the first time uh, the new Einstein's 1915 prediction that the accelerating mass should radiate energy in the form of gravitational waves is, is supported by the evidence that pulsars orbit around a companion star is slowly shrinking. And what you see here is the orbital period shrinking and when they move around and they have exactly calculated and this first as you probably know there was a Nobel Prize on this particular first discovery. And it was the first ever indirect detection. And going back, uh, just sorry, I'm not doing that. So, there's a large amount of energy get radiated uh, due to this uh, radiation. Okay. And so, how do we time the pulsars and why do we want to time? So, we could actually exactly look at this pulse arrival times and by routinely watching different pulsars, these objects what is shown in this cartoon are the pulsars and there's a radio telescope look at these different pulsars and note down their pulse arrival time. If you could do that by uh, identifying the difference between what is expected time and what is uh, actually noted and if there is a passing gravitational wave, the time ticks that we note down would actually sh show correlated uh, distortions for the different directions. In some sense, the, the parsec scale uh, interferometers, just the same way LIGO interferometer works. So there is a large observing campaign throughout the, uh, the globe and many countries are involved. And uh, what they do, they select set of pulsars in different directions and observe one pulsar at a time. And pulsars are observed at some certain cadence, like once every week. And uh, timing residuals are obtained. What is this timing residual? What is the expected time tick? And what do we get it? But it is not a very trivial job. The cartoon here shows again how the pulsar timing, uh, time of arrival is estimated. The top here is a pulsar and a radio telescope. And we obtain the signal and pass through uh, processing to get the pulse profile. A pulse profile would look like the one which I have shown, an average profile is stable and uh, we have a template and then we match it and uh, check for the time difference between the uh, arrival time and mark, note down the time of arrival. Uh, quite a lot of steps involved and you, one needs to uh, possibly look for a high signal to noise ratio observations and uh, routinely observe them and should have a very good clock in the observatory and so on. But much more than that, what needs to be done at the end of it is we note down the time of arrival. When the ticks arrived in the observatory, we have to translate it to the time at which the signal would have reached the solar system barrier center in order to keep a standard across the observatories for different people to cross verify and cross use their signals. It has to be uh, standardized. The pulse arrival time needs to be noted down in a manner. So for that, we, we follow this equation here where the first one I will uh, is to correct for the observatory clock what is on this. This is a time that we note down when the pulsar signals came and we have to note down the time offset so that we are able to go back to uh, uh, on earth a standard time. And, the, and then next we go and correct for the interstellar uh, delay caused due to the propagation of the signal across through the interstellar media which is what we call a pulse arrives dispersed. The highest uh, frequencies arrive first when we look at a broadband signal coming from the pulsars. And the lowest frequency arrive later and they follow a very nice relation uh, with a one over frequency square relation. And by following this, we can offset the dispersion measure to an infinitely infinite frequency, uh, non-infinite frequency. And then we, we bring these uh, correction factor into the arrival time. Then we go into a few other things that we have been talking about uh, just before that. The Romer delay, which is the thir third item here, which corrects for the, the difference in travel time between observatory and the solar system by center. So suppose sun is here and the earth is going around. So the time it would take for 
the signal to reach, would have reached that number that we can calculate based on the observing date, when are we observing and we can account for that delay over here and then we go into another delay correction which is the Einstein delay which accounts for the time dilation and the gravitational redshift due to sun and other masses in our solar system. This number uh, once it is corrected and we have a sapphire delay, delay which, which is due to the travel path that the signal takes in the gravitational well of the sun. So, if the pulsar that we are looking at happen to be in a, another system where there are companion stars, the, the three parameters that is shown here will have another additional set to account for the similar delays within its own system. So, once we correct, so we get a timing residual, timing, pulsar timing arrival times noted and then the differences are noted and what people do is currently uh, the detection has not yet happened, but what they do is they produce a data, data uh, base of the different pulsars and what is the residual we see. And lying in here is any passing gravitational wave signature and that can be obtained only by cross correlating with another pulsar in another direction and so on and so forth and that needs to be done. So currently the pulsar timing array effort as it moves uh, forward looking for the detection is working towards collect these databases. All of these databases are collected and internationally there's about 57 pulsars are being observed. The red ones are being observed by our campaigns and, uh, and what you see just below there is the major parameter that is uh, called the dispersion measure which is to be also estimated very accurately to get this residual straight. So ideally we should have a straight line and in here and the numbers here will be in nanoseconds, the residuals, uh, tens of nanosecond to hundreds of nanosecond all the way to microseconds and so on depending upon how sensitive we are able to get the signals and estimate. In here lies the signature of any passing gravitational wave and that is a long, uh, is a future effort and that will happen sometime when there is enough database accumulated. And incidentally, I don't have a slide and the wave, uh, gravitational wave that it, it is sensitive to is at nanosecond and um, nanohertz level, 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 9 uh, seconds and it, it's kind of a year scales, travel, travel times. So slow varying. Um, so this is recently that uh, after many years of effort, the first data from the uh, GMRT, which is the precursor to Pathfinder to the SKA, uh, have been uh, released. And that led us, uh, the work itself itself is not um, uh, straight away won't come. You have to do many more other related works, and that led to get confidence to release this database that you can see from this work. And all of this led us to another work of how do we do the same pulsar timing with the upcoming SKA. So first of the work across the globe to have got uh, its accepted paper in press. So first of the work proposing how the SKA could be configured uh, for the pulsar timing operation. And uh, this is the South African array, this is the Western Australian array. So that makes me to go to the next slide. Uh, so this is a uh, few years for, uh, we, we still have more data. At that time, the GMRT was not having much sensitivity. The, uh, currently, we have a 200 megahertz. PTAs. PTAs, they have nearly eight or 10 years, I think. Yeah. And they are looking forward to release some other uh, background uh, radiation related information very soon, I think. So, uh, which, uh, which may come <laughs> soon. Nano, um, so there is a American uh, group, European group, Australian group, and African group, and Indian group, but they all now join hands to share the data. Okay, so I, I just go to, so that calls for looking for more pulsars. So if one has to do more of this kind of science and uh, one needs to de detect more and more uh, pulsars of the kind which is of interest of special system. Also, 
in that uh, yeah they are uh, I'm just many parsecs many parsecs all over the galaxy all over okay in that way yeah it's all all of them are galaxies All in our galaxy. Uh, yeah, we have only seen, I think, uh, just at the edge of the galaxy, uh, some 21 tuck or something, uh, some nearby globular cluster. <laughs> so nothing outside the galaxy has been detected. I am not sure whether we are sensitive to, to detect, uh, detect them. Yeah. So most of them are galactic pulsars and a globular cluster pulsars. So this is the timeline of how the discovery happened. And uh, 67, Joycelyn Bell, who came here, and uh, she, she was a graduate student, if no, some of you don't know. Uh, when the discovery happened, she was the first one to discover the first pul pulsar. And there are many other events uh, happened subsequently. I'm not going to go through. But what is interesting here is this curve. <coughs> that shows something interesting over this time. Different telescopes that were involved in this are shown in this colored chart and their number of discoveries that they were able to do. So one, uh, one suspects there are many, many times the 3000 pulsars that we know are there in the galaxy and if they are all beaming towards us, SKA will be able to detect them. Okay, and, uh, and uh, this fraction, uh, the pi chart here, uh, shows another interesting, one can observe that the one which is discovered more actually use most modern technology, most modern instrumentation. Okay, even though everybody was putting effort, the multi-beaming and multi-directional search and so on that has actually resulted in uh, as much reward as the effort that has gone in. So this is the uh, confidence that is giving to us that SKA will be able to detect many more. And another interesting thing is all these observations have been done. Uh, offline so far. So now we know more than 55 years uh, the tools have matured and we can now detect uh, these things on real time. So the observation at the end of it we know whether you have something or not for 10 minutes later. So so we can attempt it and to build it for SKA is a mammoth task and uh, to do the same thing because SKA is going to have a huge sensitivity. This ch chart just show what is the current telescope on the top. If you concentrate only the middle one, uh, what the existing big telescopes and sensitive telescopes can do is a small dot and what the SKA can do are the two big uh, other circles. So several times higher sensitivity and so on. Uh, we are still building it, but, but once it is operational, it's going to be a great uh, telescope for the people who will be using it. So pulsar search with the SKA is also a very, very mammoth task. It's a high performance computing task. Uh, it's not a very simple, trivial task. And one of the major problem is the acceleration trials. The pulsar which goes on an orbit around another system, they are the interesting one that lie in the lower left corner of the diagram that I showed. And they are the ones that needs to be detected. And in order to detect them, we need to spend more computing, 10 petops. So Autoray has invested uh, time in actually finding an architecture that can be put in real time. The challenge was not, it is not possible, but it will take 10 minutes observation, will take 10 hours to process or something like that was what was possible. But we have actually made an architecture uh, that's again was possible due to the uh, background uh, uh, that we have had with other telescopes. So we have come out with a uh, observational mode and architecture which could do this uh, processing in real time. Going further, what it means is when the pulsar is on orbit around another system, the detection uh, gets affected due to the circular motion smears the pulse signal. So it has to be straightened up for even detecting. So we have to introduce a uh, filtering. It's called a Fourier domain acceleration search. And the algorithm itself is not new, but the implementation for real time is new. Uh, it's more like what is shown in the cartoon for those who this Doppler effect is a frequency changes. So the period that we are looking for changes during the observation time that will smear the pulsar and a complex filters that would pull, put this down and properly. So we have a lot of interesting things and also related works are shown here. And uh, going into the next work that I am showing here is that also led us to investigate machine learning and so on. 
and the related work is shown here. As I'm looking at the time, I'm going into the next topic. So, survey search require multiple directions simultaneous looking at the sky. So, it's not just the instrumentation that can do the pulsar processing, but we also should be able to look at some multiple direction. The effort that we are looking at right now at RRI in the lab, colleagues are here, and uh, is to get 48 directions simultaneously being able to look at uh, using, uh, uh, using the receiver that is being built for the uh, uh, telescope. The simple relation is basically we have to account for the delay and the phase and correction and so on for the different direction. The, the mathematical operation is shown here and the implementation will be in an FPGA system. What we are looking for, what we are looking for is uh, now moving further as we are working towards the hardware. We are also looking at how do we do these tests as we form beams, we have to wait for the telescope to be operational. Can we do the test in the lab? So, our colleagues have put up come up with a nice plan and that seems to be will be working. I'm not going to go into the details. This actually mimics three directions in the sky and uh, this side is a receiver and if you apply the right phase, we should be able to catch uh, differentiate N1 from N2, N2 from N3 and so on. That's the plan. So, I'm going to go into just to give you a glimpse of how the hardware looks and the heart of the hardware that does the beam forming is an FPGA and internally you see the semiconductor and I think it is a 15 or 14, 15 nanometer technology, which means the transistor sizes are separated by 15 nanometer. And it's a one of the modern uh, chips and it's a massively parallel uh, hardware. You can build in lots of logic inside and uh, the hardware is actually in the lab. And the related work is to come up soon in the paper, yeah, as a paper uh, soon, which, which talks about the antenna uh, show a selection uh, soon. So, and there are a lot of colleagues involved, a lot of accelerated th things that needs to be built and many of our expertise in the lab, have, they have shared their hands at different points, different times and I'm, I'm just showing a glimpse of what uh, is possible and the rooftop, we have some antennas as well. Uh, most likely, this would be used at some quick uh, succession when you move into have the beam former working. And then finally, I'm going to finish with the last topic. This is a state of the art, what is known as the RF system on chip field programming gate array, next generation most modern chip. So, I talked about what has been happening in the past for a few years currently and what is going ongoing now and what is the next phase of our uh, involvement likely to be. So, these receivers that I've shown are actually digital technology phases out every 18 months with the mode flaw catching up, you have a older hardware and it works less efficiently. So, this RF SOC is one of the next generation hardware and that can actually generate multiple, uh, uh, provide multiple features including the multi-beaming and correlation and other things in a very, very compact manner. The design is ongoing led by colleagues in the lab and uh, it's, it's one of the work where we have industry involvement and also we are making use of several other advanced interconnect te techniques and so on and the related work is actually under review in the GOA journal. So, here I am going to end and uh, take any questions. I know this is not possible but would you like to just comment on if let us say the entire data was digitized and uh, uh, offline analysis done, if voltage raw voltages were digitized and uh, offline analysis was done, what will be the you know, computational uh, requirement, okay. um, each, how much more? Yeah, it is uh, e each, uh, okay, I can just give a ballpark of, uh, it's going to be at least straight away 16 times more data streams and uh, number of uh, 256 to 48, if you, 256 to, it's about 256 times more, this number. <laughs> and uh, which means real time has to compete some hundreds of times. This is for the low telescope. Uh, and recording is impossible and uh, none of the, even the pulsar search or any of these things, I have shown some slide which is, uh, I think that will give a feel for it, I'm sorry. So, if you had to record, um, this is a, this is a 60 petabytes per day which corresponds to, if you have a 2 TB hard disk, 30,000 disks per day. 
so data movement itself will become impossible uh, for the pulsar search operation. <laughs> so imaging uh, may not need to record the raw data, only a time domain observations probably, probably people want to do this. Uh, or for some other reasons, RFI or some other special operation, if you want to record or even the imaging operation. So it would be that kind of number. <laughs> Commissioning phase, we do have provision to record uh, burst more data and we have access to them also. Uh, yeah, we, we can do a short burst, something like a few milliseconds and then wait for a while. <laughs> Here it is impossible to record, so we have to do the real time processing. Uh, yeah. so, so the medium that is being thought about are only SSDs. Same. Yeah, same as the disk that we have. Yeah. But I, it, I, no one is planning to do actually Real take up this data. Uh, this much volume of data. Yes, yeah, that's impossible. <laughs> yeah, almost so uh, much. even the swapping of the disk yeah. or keeping them in one place. And, um, right. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge, uh, big data uh, problem and also uh, more high, uh, high bandwidth. Uh, issues. <laughs> These SSDs are, are the best even yeah. now like maximum data density we get from SSDs only even now or? Yeah, there were some other technologies came and they didn't survive. So uh, 3D NAND or some few other technologies. Yes. So SSDs are still the highest uh, uh, throughput and higher yeah. density. Okay. The magnetic media has a problem due to the spinning and uh, mm. uh, lifetime when you keep it uh, mm -hmm. as it is. Okay, let's thank Prabhu once more.